So we'll have a look at a problem we've already done before, but we'll see how we can recast this in sort of a new light with our new tools. So we're going to have an application of center of mass to volumes of solids of revolution. In Calculus 2, the volume of a solid obtained by revolving the circular disk about the y-axis can be found by either using the method of cylindrical shells or the washer method. And so we want to check for yourself that the volume of this object that I've drawn here is given by 2 pi squared r little r squared times big R. So you can check it for yourself by using either of these methods. I'll actually go through and, and do one of these methods here. We'll use the shell method to do this and we'll do it very quickly. Uh, this was a problem right out of the calculus 2 notes but we'll do it again here just as a refresher. So here's the idea. I want to create that solid as a solid of revolution. I'm only going to look at the upper half because then I can just multiply by 2 to get the lower half. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to start with this circle or the upper half of this circle. Where is it? Well it's centered at capital R and it's a circle of radius little r. So the equation of that circle would be x minus big R squared plus y squared is equal to little r squared. And because we're only looking at the upper semicircle, I could write y as a function of x. y is equal to little r squared minus x minus big R squared. And then square rooted. So there's our upper semicircle. What we are going to do is we are going to rotate it about the y-axis and that's going to give us the upper half of this what, what is called a torus or a donut. It's called a torus. Maybe I'll write that down. This shape is called a torus um, or you could refer to it as a donut. That's fine. How are we going to get that? I'm going to use the shell method. So I'm going to take a slice, an arbitrary slice, and I'm going to do the revolution about the axes. So that slice is going to produce a cylindrical shell. It's going to look like this. So there's our cylindrical shell we get by rotating it around. And then we find the area of this cylindrical shell and integrate over all of these areas of these cylindrical shells to get the volume. What is our integral going to range over? Well, it's going to range over the x value from that point over to this point. And so what is the x value here? That's going to be capital R minus little r, whereas the x value over here is capital R plus little r. And so what is our volume? Our volume by the shell method is given by the integral of little r minus, or sorry, big R minus little r, big R plus little r, so the integral over all those x values, of the areas of all these shells. What's the area of the shell? Well, the area of the shell is 2 pi times the distance the slice is from our axes of rotation. So that's x. So that's 2 pi x times, that's, that's the circumference of the circle, if you want to think of it that way. That's the circumference of the circle. And then I multiply by the height. And the height is given by square root of r squared minus x minus big R squared dx. So that's the shell method. It is, well, the way I think we wrote it probably in calculus 2 was it's 2 pi times the radius times the height. Because that's the surface area of a cylinder. 2 pi times the radius times the, the height. So there's our integral that we need to compute. I'll bring the 2 pi out front. We'll also make things simpler by doing a substitution. The substitution we'll make is u is equal to x minus big R. So that means du is equal to dx. And our limits, when we do this substitution, what do our limits become? Our original limits were x is equal to r little r, sorry, big R plus little r, and big R minus little r. But in terms of u, our new limits of integration are negative little r and the upper limit is little r. So there's our full details of our substitution. New integral is from 
negative little r to little r, 2 pi, and then we've got our x, but our x is now u plus big R. Under our square root, we have r squared minus u squared, and dx becomes du. So there's the integral we need to compute. Let's split it up into two integrals by just multiplying through the square root to each of those terms. So the first integral is u square root of r squared minus u squared du. And the second integral is capital R times the integral of r squared minus u squared du, from negative r to r. And now we want to compute these two integrals. First thing we note is that this one is zero. Why is that zero? Well, it's an odd function, and we're integrating it over a symmetric interval about the origin, from negative r to r. And the function's odd. It's an odd function because if you evaluate at u, you get uh, the negative of the value that we get by evaluating at negative u. So it's an odd function, and so it evaluates to zero. So these are very quick things. Noticing symmetry is, is very important to eliminate a lot of extra work that one could do. Uh, how about the other one? The other integral, well, that's also straightforward one to do. Why is that? Because this integral just represents half the area of a circle. Right, the square root of r squared minus u squared, that's just the upper semicircle, and we're integrating from negative r to r, so that's the half the area of a circle of radius little r. So that means that this integral evaluates to half pi little r squared. And so now we're pretty much done, because this evaluates to 2 pi times big R, times one-half pi r squared, or in other words, we get pi squared little r squared times big R. And so what did we work out? Again, we worked out the volume of the upper half of this torus. So what we could do we could say, okay, now at this point, we've got half of the torus, so multiply by 2. Or we could just stick the 2 in right at the beginning and say, by symmetry. The volume of the torus, so if I put V sub torus there, telling us it's the whole thing, is twice the volume of just the upper half. Then I have these extra 2s that just carry their way all the way down. And there we go, we've got our formula. The key takeaway from this, that this formula actually breaks down as 2 pi big R times pi little r squared. And when I factor it in this way, those two things actually mean something. What is the first quantity, 2 pi r? If I imagine this point, the center of that circle, traveling around when it gets rotated, what the distance it travels is, is 2 pi big R. So 2 pi big R, that might be hard to see, so I'll move it onto the black. Oops, grab the wrong part of it. I'll move it onto the black background. There we go. That's the distance that center traveled. And then what is the area? of that region that I just moved. Well, the area is pi r squared. And so what we found is that the volume of the object that we've created, the volume of this torus, is really the, the volume of that circular disk, sorry, the area of that circular disk, times the distance I've rotated it through. And so this is a nice way to break down that formula. And so you may ask yourself, was this just a coincidence in this case? And it turns out it wasn't. This is known as the first theorem of Pappus. And the first theorem of Pappus says, suppose you have a plane region. So let's get a picture for this as we read through it. We have a plane region 
I'll just draw it like this. There's our plane region. And I'll just imagine it's trapped between some curve y equals f of x. And we rotate it around some axes of rotation to create our solid of revolution. How do we get the volume? Well, the theorem of Pappus says that the volume of that resulting solid is given by A times D, where A is the area of the region that we're revolving. So that's our region R, that would be the area of that blue shaded region. And what is D? D is the distance traveled by the centroid of R. So if we know where the centroid of this center of mass is, and I can figure out, you know, if I have an x bar here for its centroid, then what it travels is 2 pi x bar, then I can just multiply 2 pi x bar times the area to get the volume. That does mean I have to work out what x bar is, and that's a double integral. That's the double integral we already talked about in the previous example. So we're not eliminating the need for doing integration, but we do have this alternate way to look at how to construct a volume. And sometimes, such as in this previous example, we could just exploit symmetry and be able to figure out what x bar is without having to compute an integral. For this previous example, we were rotating a circle. So x bar was going to be right in the center of that circle. It's going to be the x coordinate of the center. So looking at it this way, sometimes we can avoid doing an integral to find the volume of a solid of revolution if we can exploit symmetry to get the center of mass. But let's see why this is true. So what we are going to do is we are going to think of this region as having uniform density. In other words, the density of that region is just going to be, we'll say, density 1. Because I don't need density to come into this. This is all about area. It's not about uh, this being a lamina and there being some variable density going on here. We're talking about areas and volumes. So we'll just assume it's density 1. Now let's write down what the integral is for the x center of mass. It's 1 over m times the integral over the region. So that would be x going from, let's say, a to b, and y goes from 0 up to f of x. And that would be x times the density, which is just 1. And so then that would be dy dx. And since that first integral is with respect to y, that's something we can work out. So that would be the integral from a to b. That would be x times y. And then we'd plug in the limits of integration, which are f of x and 0. So this just becomes x f of x dx. The last thing to note with this integral, though, is that what is mass? What is mass? Well, since we have constant density 1, mass is just the area. So really, the very last thing to note is that this is just 1 over a times the integral from a to b of x f of x dx. And that's because constant density 1 means that mass is equal to area. All right. So now let's work out the volume of the solid. Volume of solid of revolution using the shell method. So the volume is going to be the integral from a to b. 2 pi x f of x dx. I'll just clean this up a little bit. I'm going to take that 2 pi and I'm just going to put it out front. So I'll move that integral over. I'll put the 2 pi out front. And the reason I've done that is because now I notice that this appears in x bar below. In fact, x bar below has 1 over a times that. So let's just put that in here. I'm going to put a 1 over a, the integral of, from a to b of x f of x dx. So I've thrown a 1 over a in front of it, and then I'll just put an a outside at the end. So I've multiplied by 1 in a fancy way. I multiply by area over area. So this doesn't change anything, but it does allow me to note that this is x bar. So this is 2 pi x bar times a. 
And this is what we've called d in the problem. That's the distance the center of mass has traveled. So this becomes d times a. And so that proves our result, that the volume of a solid of revolution is the area of the region you're revolving times the distance the center of mass travels. So that's quite a beautiful result known as the first theorem of Pappus. And what it does is it connects. So the, what we've done here is we've connected the ideas from uh, this course, from Calculus 3, this idea of center of mass for some region. And we've connected that with volumes of solids of revolution from before. And we've got new insight into the method of cylindrical shells, for example, and its connection to these centers of mass.